So if you want to look at the Heart Sutra in the appendix of how things exist, thinking about it as we recite it. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in Rajagriha together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentrate on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshva looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shari Poop said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom he said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshva said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like it's correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, composition of factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena our emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unsustained, it's not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in empty, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no composition, no factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no no visual form, no old, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and include no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on up to and including no aging and, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times so manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. 
Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thorough pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. I got a got a got a para got a para sam got a body so ha Shari Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from their concentrate and commanded the Bodhisattva Mahasa Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, Well said, well said, son of the Yajitis, like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoke, the venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasa, Arya Avalokiteshvara, and those surrounded their entirety along with the worlds of gods, humans, asuras, and Gandhavas were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Last time you had a look at the three levels of dependent arising and understanding these three levels of subtlety, I think is very important in, of course, the philosophical views, but it's also very important in terms of daily life. So it's said that for all negative states of mind, there's an antidote, isn't there? You know, there's kind of a specific antidote for all the specific troubles we might have. Like for anger, an antidote is love or an antidote is patience, you know. So, you know, every affliction has something that will diffuse it or dispel it or transform it. But if you apply those relative antidotes at the wrong time, they kind of land in a way that can actually agitate our tendencies for analysis. And we might even turn against ourselves and inflame our negative states of mind. Kind of like if you were really anxious and someone said to you, just relax. It's like, well, it's quite true that you should just relax, but saying that is not going to make it happen, is it? So dependent arising is different because it gives you access to the truth of emptiness and is less likely to agitate the mind. And this is something that you can kind of play with experientially in your life and just see if that's true for you. But a lot of the great masters of the past, a lot of my own teachers have said, if you're really worked up, you know, if you're really agitated, you're very depressed or you're very angry or very needy or very craving, something is really stirred up within you. And analysis of this of the relative truth style is not working for you, shift and meditate on emptiness. And the way you meditate on emptiness is accessing it through dependent arising. So you would do this if, you know, say someone was really rude at you, rude towards you, and you were feeling really hurt, angry, hurt, angry, hurt, angry, and you could feel your mind really going over and over the story between the two of you and why it was so unfair that they said that and so unkind and so rude. And you're using all of the observations to reinforce your anger rather than diffuse the uncomfortable feeling that you have, you're actually making it worse for yourself, right? This happens a million times in our life. So what you do instead is, you know, you might say, oh, patience is important. Love is important. Let's meditate on patience. And so you'll pick some of the analytical topics within the patience section and find that they annoy you, <laughs> even though they're true. 
right? Even though they're true, even though you believe, even though you think they're great, now is not the time for that. It's for some reason not landing well. So what if you were to shift to who am I? What is criticism? Who are they? And you look at what is called the three spheres of emptiness, the agent, the action, and the object. And you look at them from the perspective of those levels of dependent arising that we talked about last week. So you say, okay, who am I? I am dependent upon what? Yeah, and you know, so then you cycle yourself through those levels of dependent arising. And then you ask, what is criticism? Or what is harm from the perspective of dependent arising? And then who are they as the quote, harm giver or person who should or shouldn't do this or that? And you work yourself through those levels of dependent arising from those three perspectives. And what you'll find is there's nothing to hold on to in terms of blame. And the momentum of your anger kind of runs out of gas and it just kind of goes. <laughs> you know, and then you might come to neutral and then actually get your joy back. So it's something interesting to experiment with in daily life if tuning into kind of more traditionally positive states of mind isn't enough to pull you out of a real mood or a real triggered response. So do you remember what those three levels of dependent arising are? <laughs> we went through them in great detail in the video last week. So um, throw some at me. They don't have to be in order. They don't have to be perfectly said. But what do you remember? Causes and conditions. Yep. Causes parts. and conditions is, yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, then uh, parts and context, maybe. Yeah, nice. Then mere labeling, but I don't remember how you said it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's, yep, it's all going the right direction. Would anyone add to that? Um, exactly it. But yeah, there's there's more to the story, but that's perfect. See, on, a yeah, valid, on a valid basis of designation. Yes, yes, for that last one. Yep, exactly. Yuntan, you yeah. will go again through it. You can. It's yes, but I'm not going to, um, uh, you know, I need you to think a little bit, right? Because <laughs> if I only feed you, then yes. it doesn't stick. <laughs> yeah. Again, um, your voice, it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I'll go back through it. But, um, but I really want you to sit with what does it mean? There's the words and then there's the meaning. And what is the impact of the meaning? And really, you know, because these three levels, they'll keep coming up all throughout your Buddhist career, right? And so it's, these are very important to get your head around. The distinctions between the different tenant schools are not as important. It's good to know that they exist, that there are levels of subtlety. But more important is to really understand dependent arising from the middle way consequence school view, because it's a really key philosophical premise that really has direct application in your daily life. Whether you believe in, in past and future lives or not, it's an incredibly powerful philosophical tool that is very unique to Buddhism. There's lots of schools of thought that talk about interdependence. Lots of schools of thought talk about projection and transference and these things. In Buddhism, it is way subtler. And that makes it more profound and really a lot more engaging and confronting as well. Because you're really talking about identity, you know, and basically lack of identity. And how being so certain of your key characteristics is actually not so useful in terms of your relations with others. And yet you still need to acknowledge those traits and personalities and features of yourself to know how it is that you function in this world and what you're habituated to. So that's a basic premise that's quite obvious, I think, to all of you. But to get drilling down to the subtlest part of what exactly is there we have to kind of discard all of the surface stuff of what isn't. Yeah, what isn't, not that, not that, not that. Yeah. 
Okay, so we'll have a look at that um, summary sheet and just make sure you're clear on the three levels of dependent arising and then hopefully we can unpack it a little bit. Oh, yes? Can I just ask something? Sure. On the first level, sometimes you talk about causes and conditions and sometimes about results. Or maybe I didn't understand it, but I, I didn't like, it's not synonyms, right? No. And results. Yeah, causes and conditions are isn't synonymous with causes and results. But the discussion of causes and conditions leads you to a discussion of karma and its results. Yeah. So when we say substantial cause, we're talking about the main thing. When we say coactive condition, we're talking about the supportive factors that make it ripen. Yeah. So karmically speaking, you know, we use the seed analogy all the time, right? You plant the seed through, you know, strong actions of body, speech, or mind um, that, you know, are intentional, done on purpose, you rejoiced in them, you know, strong karma, the seed is planted. That seed, whether positive or negative, is the substantial cause for an experience in the future. The conditions are then what makes it germinate or what makes it sprout down the track. So when that old seed meets with present day conditions, then it blossoms into a result. Yeah, so you get causes, conditions, and then the result. But kind of built into the cause is the potential for the result. Right. It kind of lives in a potentiality, right? Like a real actual seed does, you know, it's not a flower yet, but the potential for flower is there in the tiny seed, even before it meets with water and sunshine and light. Right. Yeah. Okay. Does that help or make it worse? <laughs> okay. No. And then when you talked about the result will start the minute the cause will finish, like it doesn't overlap. You talked it's about the result. Okay. Causes yeah. So result. as the, yeah, it's a simultaneous thing. As one finishes, the other begins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So, yeah, so we'll have a look at that. That. Um, so dependence, as um, Geshe Ngawan Sampton says in your book on a praise of dependent arising, up at the top, dependence itself means it refers to like a meeting. A reliance upon and a non-independent type of existence. Arising re relates to how phenomena come into existence. And then the types and levels of dependent arising are described below. So the summary here is, here's this King of Reasons popularized by Nagarjuna and Lama Tsongkhapa, which is like the summary of the whole premise, which is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. So the key word here is because. The reason for emptiness is dependency. So causal dependency is for all impermanent phenomena. They, re they rely on causes and conditions in order to have a result or in order to arise, function, etc.
So this is true in terms of the karma conversation, but it's also true in terms of a coarser presentation, like, you know, a table depends on wood as its substantial cause, and then the legs and the carpenter and the screws and blah, 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 as conditions. So everything that is impermanent, everything that changes moment to moment, depends on both causes and conditions. So when you see causal dependency, in the back of your mind, always kind of keep this connotation of this refers to things that are in transit, that are disintegrating and arising moment to moment, that are undergoing change in this momentary way. So this is the coarsest level, and it only applies to impermanent things. Mutual dependency and merely label dependency are for both impermanent and permanent things. We don't talk about permanent phenomena very often. The reason for this is that permanent phenomena are not usually the problematic things in our life. You know, an example of something permanent is perhaps emptiness itself or uncompounded space. Um, there's, there's just a few examples of things that don't undergo a momentary change, and they're not really that relevant to our daily life experience, so that's why we don't mention them. But absolutely everything has mutual dependency, so relies on parts and context, or and or context, in order to be understood, used, or viewed. So to say mutual dependency, it's basically saying for something to be called um, this, it relies on that. That this thisness isn't like a self-evident phenomena. And, you know, usually we use really simple, easy example of this is a small room because there is a reference of a bigger room in this house. So you can say this is a small room only based on context. It's also only a room in dependence upon having walls and fulfilling the function of a room. Otherwise, there's nothing here that you can point to and say, that's the room. And so that level, that mutual dependency level, I think is very interesting in our daily life because as soon as you are certain, as soon as you have a big opinion, find where that is specifically true precisely. And you'll find you can't find it divorced from context. This becomes really interesting when you start talking about ethics, right? What is good, what is bad, exists within a context of what we consider harmful and destructive and what we don't consider harmful and destructive. And emptiness does not negate ethics. Emptiness doesn't kind of throw the idea of destructive and beneficial out the window, but it places it in a context where we can't hold so tightly to it. Yeah, we can't be so certain of the story. Is it useful <laughs> to not be so certain of the stories we tell ourselves, to not have such fixed, hard opinions about things? Do you oh, think that's useful? How it's, yeah. Well, yeah. How it's really, I didn't understand how it's go with uh, ethics and with good and bad. If, it's, if we can't uh, be sure about the story, so it's like uh, there is no good or bad, something like that, it can be, no? No, that's what I'm saying is that that would go too far, right? That's going too far. Things do exist, right? They just don't exist inherently. And that's the key, that's the key thing that I want us to keep hearing in this conversation of emptiness. It's not nothingness. It's not negating all things. It's saying that things are only true within a certain perspective. 
if they had a self-existent reality, we would all agree about everything all the time, <laughs> right? And we would be in total harmony with our interconnection. And so we wouldn't hurt each other and we wouldn't hurt ourselves naturally without any effort because it simply wouldn't make sense to do so. But our ignorance gives us this blindness to reality where we think that our self and we think that our opinions and we think what we own and relate to is something ours in and of itself something that has the ability to be owned and named all by itself, right? So, so what we're trying to do is to not say no opinions. We're trying to say land on your opinions, definitely land on them, land on them lightly. Have the flexibility that can shift with new information. So if you say, you know, in your clinical perspective, this person has anxiety because trauma, right? And you just make it really simplistic like that. Anxiety equals trauma. <laughs> then what is anxiety and what is trauma? And you say, oh, duh, anxiety. We all know what anxiety is. Yeah, but what is their anxiety? Here's someone with anxiety. What is that exactly? Is it when they get breathless? Is it when they get shaky? Is it when their thoughts speed up? Is it when they become dissociative? Is it, because, is it when they start hyper problem solving and trying to explain their family of origin issues to themselves neurotically? What exactly is the anxiety? From a distance, you can say, yeah, they've got anxiety. Look at this and this and this thing that happened. But the problem is, is that then we can start to say that is an anxious person rather than just someone for whom anxiety comes up as a habit and a response related to many conditions that all make sense within their context. The conditions we might label as traumatic, but those same conditions might not be traumatic for someone else. Right? So, so it's really keeping context always because that stops us from becoming a fundamentalist. You know, you could become a psychoanalytic fundamentalist, <laughs> right? You could become a Buddhist fundamentalist. You could become a Jewish fundamentalist. Like fundamentalism is kind of absence of context. Yeah, having your beliefs so hardwired that they're true in all circumstances, even when that's no longer rational. You me? I heard mm -hmm. a conversation between uh, Kari uh, Krishna Murti and another uh, man uh, who talk about um, the uh, difference between uh, brain and mind, and that um, the brain is. Um, is um, depend on time and um, conflicts and the mind is without conflicts is like without thought and without uh, knowledge and I think that it, it helped me a little bit to understand that when I think about uh, phenomena that uh, is like this or like this and i think about the concept of emptiness it helped me to like you say to take things lightly because it's in into a context and he says something very nice that everything that is becoming is going to the brain it's not in the mind when you want to be something, when you feel something, when you, um, the evolution, uh, think like that, it's, it's, it's uh, something that the brain, not the mind. When you think about uh, mind, you think ab about something that is, um, and he, thought, he, he said that it's the root of all the power. 
I don't. It yeah, has, yeah, no, and, and look, yeah. it's uh, yeah. Krishnamurti has a lot of yeah. wisdom, don't get me wrong, but Krishnamurti is not Buddhist and he's not as subtle uh, as Buddhism. He's more okay. concrete. Yeah, he's not Buddhist and he's. view but you know yay krishnamurti if you know if he's your bag you know go for it but um it, it's important to realize that that is not as nuanced a view um and it's some of it is really useful some of it is i agree and some of it actually can lead you to thinking that there is some sort of atman core self of the type that buddhism doesn't believe in but that's not to say that it's not useful to believe in it, even if it's not true, right? Maybe it's useful for children to believe in Santa Claus for a while. Maybe it's useful to believe in an inherently existent self for a while, or to make the distinction is, between the brain and the mind. Atman? Atman is permanent self. Atman is a lot of what the tenants conversation is arguing with. We're saying there is no Atman because this level of subtlety, this level of subtlety, this level of subtlety. Krishnamurti um, is, is a good teacher in many ways, and but um, yeah, there is still kind of uh, an atmosphere in his teachings that seems to still point to a permanent self. Um, and the brain-mind distinction is certainly a distinction we make in Buddhism. We say there's the brain and there's the mind, and the mind is much more subtle than the brain. The mind uses the brain, but when the brain is dead, the mind continues and leaves the body and goes to another uh, body and another brain or whatever, depending on the realm. So we do make that distinction for sure. And a lot of the Eastern traditions have a lot in common philosophically and draw from one another and argue with one another. And the Buddha himself started in the Vedic traditions. There's still some things about the Vedic traditions and Hinduism that are so beautiful and so useful. And parts that Buddhism jumps over sometimes like to do with the inner energy system, they talk about a lot more explicitly a lot of the medicinal things they talk about a lot more explicitly. I think they take care of the physical body a lot better than we do. Um, if we remember to, we have that in Buddhism, but we usually forget. You know, yoga and all of these things are incredibly beneficial. But, you know, don't, don't get it confused. So what we're trying to negate again and again is, is the authentic self right? <laughs> People are always trying to find their authentic self. What nonsense, right? Um, but you do have a personality. You are unique. You have certain things about you that are different than other people. But that's not a self-created thing that is the core of your being that you need to find. It's just experiences and habits on top of a mind stream that is the same of ev as everyone else's. Yeah. And so it's only because of this mind stream that we have meeting with different experiences that we have difference amongst ourselves. And so this is useful in thinking of people that you don't relate to at all, people that you don't get. Thinking in the back of your mind, if I had the same series of lifetimes that they had, I would have the same behaviors and personality traits and I would be just like them. And that's a confronting thing for us because immediately it challenges this idea of yes but I would never you know I would never be a rapist I would never be a child molester I would never embezzle money from a charity I would never blah 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 and it's like okay well maybe you as you are in this moment wouldn't great <laughs> however 
if you'd had the same series of lifetimes as people who do those behaviors, you would do the same thing. And that immediately creates a little like resistance feeling. And that resistance feeling is the sense of self that is actually false. So whatever you can do to kind of get that uncomfortable feeling of no, but, but for me, <laughs> that me, that's the one that isn't there. Yeah. As soon as you have an opinion where you're like, this is truth, you know, in a worldly way, it usually means you're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> You're missing nuance. You know, it might be quite true that kindness is important and you know that to be true and you hold on to that 100%. What I'm saying is you can hold on to that 100% while still in the back of your mind knowing kindness is contextual. And what my view of kindness is, isn't the same for everyone. So if I'm holding to kindness and I'm a kindness fundamentalist, you know, never mind religion, then when I go up to, I don't know, the cat and pat them on the head out of kindness and the cat hisses and says, don't touch me, then I'm mad. Because I said, but I'm trying to be kind. Everyone wants kindness. I know that to be true in my heart, Right because you're forgetting context mm -hmm. now you've become a fundamentalist and you've made concrete something that is fluid you've made static something that is moving you that's a very that basic example but do you know what i mean yes yeah, sorry rana that's that's um mixing behavior with uh quality right uh, uh defining uh compassion as petting uh, someone on the head, then applying this uh, behavior to everyone without taking in, uh, in consideration the context and the timing and so on. So, um, so I wanted to ask: is uh, is quality or or potentiality are they permanent or impermanent? And I remember that I once asked you if Buddha nature is permanent or impermanent, but I can't uh, remember <laughs> what what you answered. So, so if you can also uh, get it in the list of, uh, I mean, yeah. qualities like, you know, the perfections, are they permanent or impermanent? Things can be true and can be changing, but be true the whole time that they're changing. Right. So like you, I use a lot of physical concrete examples for inner mental experiences just because it's easier for us. But like think of a river, you know, the river closest to your house. It has the same name every single day. Yeah. For the last, I don't know, 50 years, at least it's had the same name. It is changing moment to moment. It is not the same creek that I went to last week but it has the same name and it is still truly called that and that is no problem, right? So the perfection of generosity is still the perfection of generosity if you've developed it in your mind stream to the extent that it's actually a real perfection qualified by bodhicitta. You have real uncontrived bodhicitta and you're practicing generosity with that. It's something that's still changing moment to moment while continuously being labeled that. So Buddha, Buddha nature, remember the four Buddha bodies that, that a Buddha has, three of them come from the fact that the mind is um, impermanent and one part comes from the fact that the mind is empty of inherent existence. The part that is empty of inherent existence is permanent. Right, so there is an aspect of our Buddha nature that doesn't change moment to moment, but it's still empty of inherent existence. Right, so don't, don't think that impermanence and emptiness are the same thing. They're not the same thing. Yeah, impermanence is very obvious. Well, at least coarse impermanence is very obvious and we see it in the natural world. Emptiness is very subtle. 
did I did I lose you? Do you remember about Buddha nature? Right. So you have the form bodies, right, which come from development of merit, and you have the wisdom bodies that come from the development of the wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah. The wisdom bodies, there's the one that is naturally present and there's the one that needs to be cultivated. So naturally present is the fact that the mind is empty of inherent nature, but it doesn't become a Buddha body until you realize emptiness directly and finish the method side of the path. So when all of that comes together, the path of no more learning, all four Buddha bodies are present. But that one part, that one little quadrant, didn't need any work. <laughs> the other three quadrants needed work. Once the work of those three was completed, all four were there. So the permanent part is like the raw material. You know, we use that analogy of like the lump of gold underneath all of the dirt and garbage, right? The lump of gold is perfect but it still needs to be cleaned off and it still needs to be shaped into a Buddha statue. But you already have your lump of gold. You don't have to go find one. How do you call the permanent part as a name? Uh, the Svavavikakaya, the nature truth body. You've got that um, chart somewhere. Yes. <laughs> Lur yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think as you get used to the words, they'll make more sense and you'll realize it's not as hard as it seems. It's just, we're using words differently than we use even in English. This is not like a normal English conversation. It's hard for everybody to get their head around these things and how they're different from each other and how they're related to each other. It takes a little bit. So I keep going over the same terminology. So you just get used to the words and you're not thrown by the fact that that's not a normal way of phrasing things. And then you can really start to penetrate the heart of the philosophical concept. So, you know, don't feel like you need to get trapped into saying things the perfect way. But if at least your understanding is going in these levels of subtlety, it's really, I can't tell you how much it helps my daily life stress to just tap into my very basic understanding of dependent arising. It's so useful way before we realize emptiness directly. But the more we think about it on purpose related to our everyday experiences, the easier the actual realization will be. So things will appear to us or seem inherently existent for a long time, but gradually we'll stop believing it more and more and more. And our reactivity will go way down. There's um, in some Dharma centers, there's cute emptiness reminders everywhere. Like um, in the pantry of the kitchen, there is, you know, like a big bag of rice and there'll be a, a, a sign on it that says merely labeled rice, <laughs> right? <laughs> merely labeled oil, merely labeled basil. And it's like, it is rice, it is basil, but not in and of itself from its own side. You know, and even just those basic things, then when you, you know, start going to work and you see difficult person, you think much more easily, merely labeled by the mind, difficult person. Not to everyone are their behaviors difficult. Not to everyone is the stress response the same. And that by itself sometimes diffuses your stress, or at least gives you a sense of humor about having it. I think it's so important and uh, anti-racist and important uh, what you say not to be a, a, a mentalist a psychoanalyst and uh, and uh, the way that we look at uh, pathologies and avchanot uh, forgot diagnosis diagnosis mm -hmm. not to uh, which many times we, we do in our uh, um, uh, way of thinking to say he's with this uh, patho diagnosis and with this. And also I think for, for, for so many other uh, professions like uh, uh, law and uh, the, if you believe someone is a... Uh, um, is, uh, uh, 
some kind of uh, murder or some, or the, the, and you and death penalty and um, or thinking that you you just have to um, uh, leap a tear uh, from how do you say leap a tear to to get rid of of bad people and So yeah, it makes things too concrete and then it suffocates creativity and potential and forward movement. It's you know, the very simplest explanation is you do have your opinions, right? No problem. Have them. Don't live life no opinions. You know, don't live life, oh, everything's fine or everything's terrible or don't oversimplify in that way. Say, I think a good treatment would be and you try it and you commit to it and you do it and then you let go of thinking that's the way it has to be at the same time. You know, in the clinical seminars, when you're going through your cases with your, um, with your patients and everyone is weighing in about their opinions about what's going on, probably 80% of what people say is true. But is it still the whole story even after an hour of talking about an hour with one other person? Can you ever describe everything that's happening in one session with one person? You will never get to the bottom of the rabbit hole, even with just one hour with one person. All the reasons why, all the best things to do. And, and we already know that, right? But sometimes when we're tired or we're intellectually lazy, we might fall into the trap of saying, this behavior means this, this means this, this means this. And we just kind of get into a pattern And a habit that might miss some of the spontaneity of the moment, you know, and might miss that when this person demonstrates a behavior I've seen a million times, it actually means something different than what I'm usually accustomed to. So, you know, you, so you follow the trends and the patterns that you're observing about people over time. That's very useful. But if you're thinking that you can nail it down, to one reason why or three reasons why, then we're limiting ourselves and also limiting our ability to be of benefit. Can you please explain in what way um, uh, labeling is the most subtle way of uh, coming into existence? Um, and uh, the other question is, by saying that this is how something comes into existing into existence, It means that without these uh, processes, it wouldn't have come into existence, right? So labeling in itself makes uh, something, uh, make, I don't know what the something is without existing, but it makes, it, 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 it does the action of um, uh, making something existent. In this view? Well, it's like you can very, very roughly say labeling is creation. Mm -hmm. Very, very roughly, very gently, knowing that there's more nuance than that. But just as kind of a starting point, you could say labeling is creation in a sense. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that when you look at parts, then you give it a label. Right? But those parts aren't the thing that gave the label. The mind gave the label onto the parts. The illusion is, if things are assembled in a certain way, then they have a natural label. You know, like a, like a car or a chariot we usually use in Buddhism. So if all of the parts of a car are there, then necessarily it's a car, obviously. When in fact you could have all those parts just in a heap you know and and not label it a car or the car could be assembled but people don't know what it is and have never been introduced to the concept so for them it's not a car so it's not a self-existent car just like a good person or a bad person is not a self-existent good or bad person they're labeled on a basis of parts the exaggeration is thinking that those parts are what made it But it still does have parts. 
So that's why I'm talking about labels of subtlety. So for something to exist, it depends upon parts. That's quite true. And you can kind of rest there for a minute and be like, okay, yep, I've got it. And then you think, well, what about those parts creates my impression? Yeah, why am I able to distinguish this from that? If things were just as they are, there would be no need for labeling also. So if something was a table in and of itself, we would never need to be introduced as children to the concept of tables, right? As children, we might think, oh, it's a house, it's a fort, it's a something to play on, it's, it's this, it's that, it can be anything. You know, we have to be introduced to the concept. Then we believe the concept so often that it jumps back at us as if it's true from its side rather than something we've attributed there. So this is the subtler level of the illusion that we're trying to unpack is to notice the way things seem to be telling us what they are and that our reactions seem to be happening to us when it's the other way around. Yeah, so, you know, it just, it takes a minute to kind of sit with what does that mean, right? But we always use the example of like the letter A, right? There's just lines before you knew English. It was just line, line, line. Someone said, it's an A when you see line, line, line. You repeat, repeat, repeat. Now, when you look at a page, the A tells you it's A-ness, right? It says, I am an A. And you don't have to stop and think that's an A there. It comes off the page and tells you what it is. That's the impression that we have. That's the illusion. But before we were introduced, it was just lines. Yeah. So keep coming back to when you're having a negative response, when you're having an uncomfortable feeling, the words in your head are, I feel this way because this is at fault or that is at fault. This is why I feel that way. So simplistic. Yeah. So missing the big picture of things. And because of that, so disempowering for our own experience to evolve past that. So you have to take what you already know to be true before you even met Buddhism and then use Buddhism to take it subtle. Yeah. So you use the fact that you know that cold makes you uncomfortable, makes you suffer, but not in and of itself. A temperature that you might say, this is too cold for me, I'm uncomfortable, that's why I'm unhappy, might not be a temperature that makes you unhappy if you're doing something really enjoyable that you love, your impression of this is too cold fades to the background and is not the dominant part of your experience anymore. You know, or if you conditioned yourself in a certain way, that temperature wouldn't have the same effect, blah, blah, blah. You know, I remember a teacher of mine had a sabbatical in Antarctica, and he spent a whole year in Antarctica. And by the end of it, when he came back to Montana, the winter felt warm to him. And he could be running around with his t-shirt and the rest of us had big coats on. You know, so we think, oh, inherently, this temperature means you must have a coat or you will suffer and die. And he was running around in his T-shirt like, nope. <laughs> but the year before, he needed a coat just like the rest of us, for example. OK, so so let's look at this merely labeled dependency, because it is it's a subtle point. I, I think that you get I think that you get it, but there's maybe more to get about it. So all impermanent and permanent phenomena rely on a basis of designation. I've misspelled designation. Sorry about that. <laughs> and the or a mind's imputation to exist, be held in awareness, be engaged with, etc. So this probably reminds some of you of a Zen koan that everybody knows. What is the sound of one hand clapping? If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Those Zen koans are trying to get you to think in this way, to try and understand that things don't exist divorced from context. They don't exist divorced from conditions. They don't exist divorced from a mind to label them. But they exist, but not without those things. And those things themselves 
depend on those things. So a space of infinite possibility opens up to you where you realize that not everything can be anything, but that there is kind of a raw energy and, I don't know, consciousness that is of the universe that we then draw outlines around and we frame and we say, now this is what I see and this is what is true, even though all of this is true and could be seen. And because we limit it to this very small focus, we react to only this small focus. And then it's an unskillful reaction because it's not understanding the whole story. So I think that just when you're walking around, notice your own reactions and ask yourself, what is the dependency here? Yeah, I, <laughs> right, the person, myself, I am dependent upon causes and conditions. I'm dependent upon parts and context. I'm dependent on mere designation by a valid consciousness. So is whatever I'm using and touching and reading and engaging with and seeing. So is everyone I'm talking to. So then a spacious, flexible mind comes back to you. And if you can keep, you know, if you start to feel too crazy, just land back on ethics. Yeah, keep landing back on ethics. And no ethics are important, the ethics of non-harmfulness. But those two exist within a context. But before we do the dedication, let's just sit with those three levels of dependency for just a second and, and just kind of like be with it. And then we'll shift to the dedication prayer. Okay, so just have a look at those. Okay, so we'll now dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. What is is old, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. So just uh, sit with it, okay? <laughs> It'll come clear, but you have to think about it again and again.